They are five leaders of the oldest intelligence alliance in the world, and for the first time they are going public together. They wanted to speak with 60 Minutes about war, terrorism, and the country that they believe is the greatest intelligence threat in history. There is no country that presents a broader, more comprehensive threat to our ideas, our, our innovation, our economic security, and ultimately our national security. For more than five years, American businessman Imad Shargi was a prisoner of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Last month, Shargi and four other Americans were freed in a deal that has drawn fierce criticism because of Iran's strident support of Hamas. If I Tonight, Shargi tells his story for the first time. I learned a lot about myself, about humanity, about what is important in life. Being thrown in a cell, it's the closest you come to death. In order for Pink to do this, and this, okay, tighten up your stomach. She showed us she does this. Now sing. Where there is desire, there Come is gonna on. be a flame. Come on. Where there is a flame, someone's bound to get burned. Come Just because it burns doesn't mean you're gonna die. You gotta get up. <laughs> I'm Leslie Stahl. I'm Bill Whitaker. I'm Anderson Cooper. I'm Sharon Alfonsi. I'm John Wertheim. I'm Cecilia Vega. I'm Scott Pelley. Those stories and more tonight on this special 90-minute edition of 60 Minutes. War in the Middle East has the FBI tracking more potential threats of terrorism in the United States. Tonight, the Bureau's director, Christopher Wray, tells us his main concern is not an organized attack, but lone actors inspired by the violence. We met Ray Wednesday for an unprecedented interview that included him and the intelligence directors of our English-speaking allies. Together, they know more about the threats in the world than perhaps anyone. They're known as the Five Eyes, and they have never appeared in an interview together. They're doing it now because they're alarmed by China, which they say is the greatest espionage threat democracy has ever faced. But given the war, we'll begin with FBI Director Ray on the threat of terror at home. We have seen an increase in reported threats, but vigilance is, is heightened right now just because of the fluid and volatile environment in the Middle East and the ways in which that could spin out uh, in the U.S. By the time we had gathered for our interview, it had already spun out in the United States. In Illinois, a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy was stabbed to death by a man enraged by the attack on Israel. How do you stop that kind of thing? The key that we've found in stopping it more and more is trying to have the right eyes and ears out in the community. And so what we need to have are people in the community, when they see something starting to go awry, calling law enforcement. Um, and the attacks that we've been able to prevent over the years have almost always included somebody who's made that phone call. Uh, and the attacks that haven't been prevented have almost always had somebody who had that information, but for one reason or another didn't make that phone call. About 30 Americans were killed in the Hamas attack Two American hostages were released Friday, which left 10 still missing. Sources tell us it's unclear how many of them may be hostages. Israel leads the hostage effort. The FBI is prepared to help. We're going to work closely with our partners, uh, our Israeli partners, our uh, U.S. Embassy partners, um, the whole U.S. government to do whatever we can to ensure that those hostages uh, come out safe, but, uh, but make no mistake, this is a dangerous time. We met Chris Ray with his fellow intelligence chiefs of the so-called Five Eyes. From the left, Mike Burgess of Australia, David Vigneault of Canada, Ken McCallum of the United Kingdom, 
and at far right, Andrew Hampton of New Zealand. The Five Eyes Alliance was formed after World War II to gather intelligence, but this was their first public appearance ever, and they did it in Palo Alto, California, Silicon Valley, to make this point. The technology secrets that are about to change the world in artificial intelligence, biology, and computing are falling into the wrong hands, stolen in a global espionage campaign by China. The People's Republic of China represents the defining threat of this generation in this era. There is no country that presents a broader, more comprehensive threat to our ideas, our, our innovation, our economic security, and ultimately our national security. We have seen efforts by the Chinese government, directly or indirectly, trying to steal intellectual property, trade secrets, personal data, uh, all across the country. We're talking everything from Fortune 100 companies all to smart startups. We're talking about agriculture, biotech, healthcare, robotics, aviation. Uh, academic research. We probably have somewhere in the order of 2,000 active investigations that are just related to the Chinese government's effort to steal information. But all countries spy. Mike Burgess of Australia. Yes, absolutely all countries spy. Our countries spy. All governments have a need to be covertly informed. Um, all countries seek strategic advantage. But the behaviour we're talking about here goes well beyond traditional espionage. This scale of the theft is unprecedented in human history, and that's why we're calling it out. They were calling it out this past week in private meetings with 15 top Silicon Valley executives and Stanford University. This is not just about government secrets or military secrets. It's not even just about critical infrastructure. It's about academic research in our universities. It's about promising startup companies. People, in short, who probably don't think national security is about them. Ken McCallum is director general of MI5, the UK's FBI. So we see the theft happening in a range of ways. One is that we see employees within those companies being manipulated. Often in the first instance, they are not aware of what is happening. We have seen, for example, the use of professional networking sites to reach out in sort of masked, disguised ways to people in the UK, either who have security clearance or who are working in interesting areas of technology. We've now seen over 20,000 examples of that kind of disguised approach to people in the UK who have information that the Chinese state wishes to get its hands on. You have um, the biggest hacking program in the world by far, bigger than every other major nation combined, stolen more of our personal and corporate data than every nation, big or small, combined. Are you saying that it is a threat to the way of life of democracies? It is a, a threat to our way of life uh, in, a, in a number of ways. The first is that when, when people talk about stealing innovation or intellectual property, that's not just a Wall Street problem. That's a Main Street problem. That means American jobs, American families, American livelihoods, and the same thing for every one of, of our five countries directly impacted by that theft is not some abstract concept. It's, it has flesh and blood, kitchen table consequences. Here's one example. When China stole the technology secrets of one American wind turbine company, the company lost its competitive advantage. Sales collapsed, and it laid off nearly 700 workers. When you encounter a company that isn't sure that it wants to cooperate with you, what do you tell them? I would say that if you are operating at the cutting edge of tech in this decade, you may not be interested in geopolitics, but geopolitics is interested in you. And you would be reckless, not just with my secrets, but with your own company's viability, with your shareholders' capital, if you didn't think about what that means. We all came into these meetings with the mindset of, we want to figure out how we can better help protect you, your innovation, your intellectual property. They all came into the conversations with ideas of ways they can help us help them. The intelligence chiefs told us Chinese companies are overseen by the Communist Party. And for many, espionage is a sideline on behalf of the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Is the Chinese government building industrial sites in your countries that are actually 
covers for espionage operations. David Vigneault of Canada. We have seen in the past uh, acquisition of, of land, acquisition of, uh, of different uh, companies where you, when you start to dig a little bit further, you realize that it's, uh, there is a, a, another intent. And we have seen and blocked attempt by the PRC to acquire uh, locations near sensitive strategic assets of the country where we knew that the ultimate purpose was for uh, spying operations. And, uh, Director Ray, have you seen that in the United States? We've seen a variety of efforts by uh, Chinese businesses, some cases state-owned enterprises, in some cases ostensibly private companies, attempting to acquire businesses, land, infrastructure, what have you, in the United States in a way that presents national security concerns. Including investigations recently of Chinese companies purchasing land and building plants near U.S. military bases. We welcome business with China, visitors from China, academic exchange. What we don't welcome is cheating and theft and repression. Political repression is another target of the Five Eyes. They told us they're fighting China's meddling in elections and violence aimed at silencing Chinese dissidents living in their countries. We had a case that, we, that was indicted not that long ago where there was a, an actual congressional candidate who was very critical of the Chinese government. The efforts were initially to try to see if they could come up with dirt on the candidate to derail his candidacy, then to try to concoct dirt, just fiction, uh, about the candidate. And then if that didn't work, there was even discussion about the candidate befalling a, a horrible accident. That candidate was Yang Shan, a Chinese American who served in the U.S. military and protested China's crackdown on Hong Kong. Last year, he lost the Democratic nomination in a New York congressional race. In court filings, prosecutors say a Chinese agent hired an American private investigator to discredit Yang and left the investigator a voicemail saying, violence would be fine. Beat him until he cannot run for election. Is that the threat of violence in the United States that we face from the Chinese government? We have seen over and over again efforts to really stop at almost nothing to intimidate people who would have the audacity here in the United States where we have freedom of speech to express criticism of the regime. While we have the allies around the same table, let me ask this question. The catastrophe in the Middle East, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Chinese espionage on a scale that's never been seen before. Are all of you stretched too thin? I think one of the strengths of the Five Eyes Partnership is that we share some really fundamental values as countries and as, as agencies. Andrew Hampton of New Zealand. Part of how you respond to that is by working together as like-minded countries. Part of how you respond to it is <clears throat> partnering across our own countries, as we've talked about, with community groups, with the private sector. They are our biggest strength. For its part, China said this about the Five Eyes point of view. We firmly oppose the groundless allegations and smears toward China. MI5's Ken McCallum told us never in his nearly 30 years in intelligence has the threat been so complex. Iran, Russia, terrorism. But it was China that was the first to get the five eyes around this table and before the eyes of the public. I mean, essentially what you have with the Chinese government is the autocracy and oppressive regime of, uh, you know, East Germany combined with the cutting edge technology of Silicon Valley. And the combination represents a, a daunting first of its kind threat for the United States and for our allies. You seem to be saying that the Chinese government is running a criminal enterprise. Well, I would say the Chinese government, if they want to be a great nation, it's time for them to start acting like one. Uh, and that includes abiding by its own commitments not to steal innovation. That includes not exporting repression to other countries. That includes working with 
all of our countries and all the other uh, countries that we work with all the time who have common threats like cybercrime, fentanyl trafficking, money laundering. Uh, it means not working with criminals, uh, but rather working to uphold the rule of law. Now, Margaret Brennan on assignment for 60 Minutes. For more than five years, 1,975 days, American businessman Imad Shargi was a prisoner of the Islamic Republic of Iran. He spent much of that time in the country's most notorious prison in a dreaded ward run by Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Last month, Shargi and four other Americans were freed in a complicated deal involving $6 billion in restricted Iranian oil revenue. The deal drew criticism at the time for granting financial relief to a regime the U.S. government considers the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism. It drew even more scrutiny after Hamas, which is financially supported by Iran, attacked Israel two weeks ago. With more than 200 hostages remaining in Gaza, including some Americans, Shargi's ordeal is a stark illustration of the difficulties and perils involved in bringing American citizens home. This story um, should have never happened, but I didn't waste five and a half years, Margaret. I learned a lot about myself, about humanity, about what is important in life. Being thrown in a cell, it's the closest you come to death. Imad Shargi is a dual citizen of the U.S. and Iran. He left Iran at age 13, before the 1979 Islamic Revolution. In the U.S., he went to college, met his wife Bahre, and started a business representing U.S. chemical companies in the Middle East, and later worked for a private equity firm in Abu Dhabi. By 2016, with their daughters off to college, Imad and Bahre, who is also Iranian-American, decided to travel to Iran and rediscover their roots. Iran had just agreed to a landmark deal to limit its nuclear development in exchange for sanctions relief, which made Shargi think the country was full of opportunity. His father thought otherwise. He said to me, he said, Ahmad, you don't know this country. People like you will dual nationalities. They pick these people up once in a while for whatever use they have for them. And I said, Dad, give me a break, you know? I have never been in the U.S. government, nothing. And I guess if anybody asks me in one sentence, what have you learned from this experience? I would say, listen to your dad. The couple, both in their 50s, began spending time in Iran. Shargi found work consulting for an Amsterdam-based company investing in Iranian businesses. Was there anything that suggested to you that you were a target, that there was going to be a problem? You know, I thought I have a better chance of getting hit crossing the road by a motorbike. When I was there, I did not see this coming. Just past midnight on April 23, 2018, about 15 armed agents showed up at the family house in Tehran. Gentleman walked in. He said, this is an arrest warrant for you and for your wife. On what grounds? He wouldn't tell me at the time. Around 2.30 in the morning, they said, OK, get ready. We are taking you. And my wife said, no, you can't take him. And they told her to sit down and mind her business, that they'll get to her later. What did that mean? I didn't know at the time. So when they took me out of that house, I did not know what was going to happen to my wife. That's terrifying. Yep. It's not a position you want to be in. He was taken to a place in Tehran Iranians have long feared, Evan Prison, to a special ward known as 2A, run by the intelligence division of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. They took me to a room. They told me to strip naked. They gave me some blue garbs. They told me, this is the end of the line for you, and most likely you'll never see the outside world. From now on, nobody will address you by your name. You're a code now. 97010 was my code. That's dehumanizing. Uh, they are experts at that. And then hell starts. Torture. Threats of torture and psychological torture. 
they take you to a very small room and then they throw a giant of a human being in there who proceeds to hit you, to push you around, to threaten to kill you. And then the good cop comes in and he says, look, I can put a stop to this. You just need to confess. Confess to what? They said, you have to confess that you are a spy. <laughs> Which is ludicrous. Shargi says his interrogators threatened him with electrical shocks, waterboarding, and hanging, but never followed through. So I realized they don't want to damage their product at that point. Product? Correct. Why do you choose that word? Because that's what I was. You believe you were taken simply because you were American to extract a price? Correct. He told us some interrogations went on for nine hours a day. What did you tell them during all those hours of questioning? I mean, the most mundane things. The first day they kept asking me, why did you go to the White House church? And I'm sitting to myself going, I know the White House doesn't have a church. And then it clicked. They had hacked my Facebook. They had seen the pictures of us attending my daughter's events at school at the National Cathedral. They had no idea the National Cathedral had nothing to do with the White House. This is an intelligence service. You would be surprised. They had my telephone, so they had gone through the list of every person I'd ever met during the last 30 years of my business career. Who are these? Who are those? These questions would go on day after day after day. In December 2018, after eight months of interrogation, Imad Shargi was suddenly released on bail. His wife, Bahre, who'd never been arrested, was able to leave the country. Imad expected to join her soon. He says he received a letter of exoneration, but he wasn't allowed to leave Iran. Now my story takes a bizarre turn. My file had been sent to the Revolutionary Court. It's where a gentleman by the name of Judge Salavati sits also known as the Hanging Judge. In November 2020, the Hanging Judge sentenced Shargi to 10 years in prison under a broadly worded statute which prohibits cooperating by any means with foreign states against Iran. Before Shargi had to report back to prison, a friend came up with a plan. To escape. To escape. And I said, let's go. Smugglers helped him make his way to Iran's mountainous border with Kurdistan, but about 30 miles from freedom. I look up and there is about 15 guys with AK-47 pointing at the car. They threw me on the ground and their team leader came. He opened the scarf that I, they had put around my eyes and he looked away and he shook his head to his team members. They were looking for somebody they else. They were looking for somebody. But now we have round two of incarceration. This Iranian propaganda photo taken in January 2021 shows him bearded and shackled, being escorted back to Ward 2A, where he says he underwent another eight months of interrogation. The second eight months, I was interrogated close to 400 hours. How do you stay sane? All those times, there was never a doubt in my mind that my government would get me out. That was my hope. Back in Washington, Bahre and her daughters campaigned for Imad's release and sought help from the State Department, which reviewed Shargi's case and determined he was wrongfully detained. The Biden administration had been trying to broker both the release of American detainees and the renewal of the Iran nuclear deal, which the Trump administration had pulled out of. But the talk stalled. In the fall of 2022, widespread protests broke out following the death of a young woman in the custody of Iran's morality police. In Evan Prison, the inmates rioted and set fires. The guards responded with tear gas and bullets. It was happening a couple of yards from where I was sitting in my room. Now, if I left, I could be shot. If I stayed, I could suffocate. With no good option, he stayed in his cell. Shargi says he was rescued, ironically, by his tormentors, a team of revolutionary guards. They were pale white when they saw me. They were like, Ahmad, let's get the hell out of here. Because you're worth more alive than you are dead. Correct. 
Shortly after the fire, Imad's sister Netta sought a meeting with Iran's top diplomat at the United Nations, Amir Saeed Iravani. She wanted to learn what was holding up a prisoner deal. He acknowledged to you that there were people inside his own government that didn't want the deal to happen. Yeah, I mean, he acknowledged that, and just as there are people in our government who didn't want this to happen, you know, we're dealing with innocent human lives, and we want to rectify the situation, but for other people, it's politics and it's power, and they get in the way. Arranging a meeting with President Biden proved more difficult for Netta. Determined to help her brother, she went to this crowded White House reception for the Persian New Year and managed to buttonhole the president after he spoke. I told him there are American citizens who are innocent and need to come home as soon as possible because time is not on our side. After roughly two years of start-and-stop negotiations, the U.S. and Iran reached a complex agreement. Six billion dollars that Iran had earned from selling its oil had been tied up in a foreign account for years due to U.S. sanctions. According to U.S. officials, Iran can use the money to buy humanitarian goods like food and medicine once the U.S. approves the transactions. The money goes to the suppliers, not the government of Iran. On September 18th, President Biden granted clemency to five Iranians accused of nonviolent crimes. Five Americans, including Ahmad Shargi, were released and flown to Qatar. From there, they flew to a military base in Virginia, where their families were waiting. I hadn't seen my daughters for five and a half, six years. I had missed all their graduations, birthdays, anniversaries with my wife. Uh, it's like being born again. We had thought we were going to be freed so many times, and this was it. Since his release, Imad's making up for lost time with his family. He's also had time to reflect. You think to yourself, what was this all about? Why did they do this to me and to my family? For five years. And the short answer is hostage-taking as statecraft. If you are an American? Yes. An Iranian-American? No. Iranian-American, Italian-American, American, do not go to Iran. Less than three weeks after Shargi's release, Hamas, which is financially backed by Iran, attacked Israel. As Israel counterattacked in Gaza, some U.S. lawmakers have called for blocking Iran's access to the $6 billion. The White House insists no money has been released so far, and sources told us the arrangement has not changed. When you watch the news right now and you see what has happened in Israel, not just about the people killed, but the hostages that yeah. have been taken, what is that like for you? I cannot imagine what it must feel like to have your daughter, your son, your wife, your father being taken hostage. And I cannot believe what their families are going through. I just wish them a safe return home. Twenty twenty three has been a year of sold out stadium concerts, but only one of the women breaking attendance records has built a global brand singing upside down. High flying stunts are only part of her appeal. Alicia Moore is known as much for her party anthems as her powerhouse voice. And if the name is unfamiliar, it's because she's best known by her one word professional identity, Pink. Pink famously has no filter. And fans who have followed her 25-year career have come to expect her to share every detail of her sometimes troubled story. Do I have this right? You're willing to talk about anything. Any question is fine. There's no offense taken. Yeah, it's all, I'm, I'm open to all of it. A lot of people in your world thrive on protecting privacy. You're an open book. Why? I guess I look at it in a very specific way. If I'm a mystery to you, how can I expect you to connect with me? And if I'm a person that's desperate for connection, then why would mystery be interesting to me? I want to know you. I want you to know me. All right, you guys want to start with Phil? Start by coming to one of her concerts. We were there for her homecoming shows in Philadelphia last month, one stop on a year and a half long tour. 
She's already set attendance records in stadiums around the world and sold more than $350 million in tickets. A Pink concert is part rock rager Heart Broadway Spectacle with some Tinkerbell sprinkled in. So what? She belts out her hits while flipping and flying a hundred feet in the air. And she does it without lip syncing. When she says she actually sings better upside down, believe her. Now 44, when she looks out into the crowd, she sees a lot more moms and dads. She calls herself and her fans the uncool kids and takes great pleasure in taking on their haters. Whether in her shows or on social media, her message is, don't mess with them or me. This image that you've created, you've got this famous snarl. Yeah. Right? I wonder if when that started, the message was, this is a woman that you don't want to mess with. Well, this is a woman you don't want to mess with is a true statement. I know what certain people think of when they look at me, down to the fact that I'm muscular, I'm outspoken, and I have short hair. I'm possibly a dude, definitely a lesbian. People sort of put you in a box no matter what you look like. Then my box happens to be if you're outspoken and you don't sort of bend to societal norms, then you're scary and dangerous. And the reality is? The reality is I'm the goofiest, most fun, loving person that will possibly kick your ass if I have to. Come on, children. These days, life is less get the party started and more get these kids to bed. Her six-year-old son, Jameson, push, push. and 12-year-old daughter, Willow, are often on tour with her, riding their scooters on stage during sound checks. For the hometown show in Philly, Pink's husband, motocross star Carrie Hart, was there, and so was her mom, Judy. This is our <laughs> tour library. Backstage, there's a library where the team swaps books. Pink um, has a romantic novel she needs to return. We have a little, you little sign, have a in sign sheet. In sheet. You actually have a sign-in sheet. I wish I sheet. had the ch -ch -ch thing, but we don't have that. So I've been backstage for other artists, and some of the things I've seen are a lot of booze, yeah. a lot of party. Cool. My dressing room used to be like whiskey and cigarettes. Then it was ball pits and stuffed animals. When she's not on the road, she's home in Southern California. This is where she's Alicia Moore, a Mohawk-wearing mom who bakes sourdough and is part of the PTA. She's either driving for school drop-off or driving a forklift on her 25-acre vineyard. She says she schooled herself on the science of winemaking by studying late into the night after her shows. So, do I have this correct? You don't make pink rosé? I do not make pink rosé. My colors? Grenache is, it looks like a white wine. Occasionally it's a bit peach, but... You drink it? I drink a lot, well... Biggie Smalls once said, never get high on your own supply, but... <laughs> you sure did. Yes, I do. I make a lot of wine. <laughs> Home is also where she makes music. This is my gorgeous. music room. It's really great. Yeah. She's a writer on most of her songs and says no topic is off limits, not even the ups and downs in her marriage. And you taught yourself and to play on this. Sort of, kind of. I mean, I can play halves of songs. One of my favorite songs is Make You Feel My Love. And I played this every day during COVID. This is a Bob Dylan song made most recently famous by Adele. It's one of my favorite songs. When the rain is blowing in your face And the whole world is on your case I could offer you a warm embrace To make you feel my love so I played that wow. every day Wow! until I was good yourself. enough to go on stage and play an instrument. 
She grew up singing opera and gospel in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. But she says tension at home made her desperate to leave. She calls her relationship with her father, Jim Moore, complicated. He served in Vietnam and passed away two years ago. As a teen, arguments with her mother were so bad, Pink says one fight got physical and her mom fell downstairs. She now calls that her one regret in life. You said you were the kid that other moms didn't want their kids to play with. Why? I was a punk. I had a mouth. I was, I had a chip on my shoulder. Basically, I grew up in a house where every day my parents were screaming at each other, throwing things, hated each other. And then I got into drugs. I was selling drugs. And then I was kicked out of the house. I dropped out of high school. That was off the rails. What happened on Thanksgiving in 1995? Thanksgiving of 1995, I was at a rave and I overdosed. I was on, oh boy, ecstasy, angel dust, crystal, all kinds of things. And then I was out, done, too much. You almost died. Yeah. She says that was the end of hard drugs for her and weeks later got her first record deal as the lead singer in an R&B girl group. But they didn't last long. So when you're starting out, the industry sort of seems like they've got you going down a path. They paint you with an R&B brush. Yes, I signed to LaFace Records. We were the token white girls on a black label. I was told to take etiquette classes very early on. Uh, They wanted me to learn how to wear dresses and use the right fork. How'd that work out? I went once, but it didn't work. What did they not like? I think they were trying to turn me into something that I didn't want to be. Image is everything in this business. Using her teenage nickname Pink, she went solo, and her first album was an R&B double platinum success. She then broadened her sound to include rock and pop. And not so subtly named her next album, Misunderstood. It was a career-defining hit, selling 15 million copies around the world. You'd said in the past it felt like you were never winning the popularity contest among your peers. What do you mean by that? We sold three million tickets in the last six months, but you don't really hear about it unless you went. So at the end of the day, do I give a who talks about me? As long as the mom and the daughter or the dad who's in the pink t-shirt, as well as his daughter and her three friends had a fantastic time, or the gay couple that came together and felt super safe at my show because no one heckled them, that's what really matters. And then there's this. We wanted to know how she does it, singing upside down as an asthmatic, no less. Well, it took a lot of childhood gymnastics classes and tortured training sessions with her aerialist coach, Drea Weber. (laughs) Okay, tighten up your stomach. Okay, ready? Be nice. Now sing. Where there is desire, there is gonna be a flame. Come on. Where there is a flame, someone's bound to get burned. Come Just because on. it burns doesn't mean you're gonna die. You gotta get up. <laughs> I'm not just a singer, I'm a gymnast. I can do all kinds of things. I'm physical. This body, like, this, the muscles that, that scare people, are it's my power, right? It's like, I don't eat well to look good. I eat well to go far, fast, and hard. At 5'3", she is all muscle, and make no mistake, as tough as she looks. I realize that the machete that I've always carried, this metaphorical machete that I've always carried that made me a really difficult kid is what makes me really good at what I do Mm. today. And it makes me a survivor. Do you feel like you needed that hard edge, that machete to climb as far as you've climbed in this business particularly? Absolutely. I never got a record deal because I was cute. 
I got a record deal because I was fiery. I had a lot to say and I had a voice. So I'm relieved I don't have to fall back on sort of conventional beauty and and that doesn't have to be my thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to keep that up mm -hmm. either as I mm -hmm. age. I don't have to be that. I can be all of this. She I won't need that. a plan B anytime soon, but as she told us at midnight over a glass of wine in her dressing room in Philadelphia, she is planning the next chapter. It's what any self-respecting, acrobatic, sequin-loving entertainer would do, a Las Vegas residency. I would like to have the best show that Vegas has ever seen, and I think that I can. For a performer like me to have a stage that doesn't have to travel, <laughs> oh my God, you can do so much. So all these years in, what's the hardest part about your job now? I guess that I keep demanding more and more and more and more from myself, physically, emotionally, spiritually, vocally. I want to raise the bar all the time, and I'm sort of going against time, right? How do you keep out doing that? I like going against societal norms. When they say a woman has to slow down, become smaller, take up less space, calm down. No, absolutely not. Why? Who says? Why can't we ride it till the wheels fall off? <laughs> That's what I plan on doing. Go backstage with Pink after a concert. Come on, get in. At 60minutesovertime.com. The last minute of 60 Minutes is sponsored by United Healthcare. There for what matters. Once again, tonight, this isn't really the last minute of 60 Minutes because this expanded edition of 60 Minutes runs 90 minutes. Coming up, an all-new visit to the self-governing Isle of Man, a jewel in the Irish Sea, beautiful, ancient, and tranquil, except for once a year. When motorcycles race at speeds near 200 miles per hour through man's villages and narrow country lanes in one of the deadliest sports anywhere. So stick around, and when we come back, we'll take you someplace you've probably never been. I know we hadn't. If you asked most Americans to point out the Isle of Man on a globe, it might take them a while. The 30-mile-long island sits in the middle of the Irish Sea, with England to the east and Ireland to the west. It once was the seat of a Viking kingdom. Today, Britain's King Charles is head of state, or Lord of Man. People born there are known as Manx, and the Isle has its own unique language and a tailless cat also called Manx. A few hundred years ago, it was known as a haven for smugglers. The buccaneers are gone. Bankers have now turned the Isle into a tax haven. But what drew us to the Isle of Man was not the beauty or the banking, but a hair-raising annual event that at first glance seems totally out of place on this tiny jewel of an island. With emerald fields and rugged coastlines dotted with ruins of medieval castles, the pace of life on the Isle of Man is slow, even sleepy, for 50 weeks of the year. But for two weeks, starting at the end of May, it becomes one of the loudest, fastest, most dangerous places in sport. It's like nothing else, no matter what you've done in your life, until you see a bike do the, what we're doing here, nothing compares at all. Like, in places it shouldn't wheelie, it's like, Whoa. British motorcycle racer Peter Hickman is one of the best in the world. And a 13-time winner of a race known as the Isle of Man TT short for both tourist trophy and time trial. Not long before we met Hickman, we watched him fly over the first jump on the course at a place known as Ago's Leap. We saw you go by Ago's Leap today, 
And truly, it was a blur. <laughs> it was just like, like a, a speeding bullet. How, how fast do you think you were going when you went by there? I go leaps around 185 to 195 mile an hour, somewhere around there. It's top gear. Besides the blinding speeds, what truly makes the Isle of Man TT unique is that it is run on public roads that are open to normal traffic until just 30 minutes before racing begins on a 37-mile course that covers much of the island, running through villages and pastures, with riders taking more than 200 turns just inches from rock walls and buildings and residents. You literally race through a village, and it just feels like you shouldn't be doing it, but we're allowed. <laughs> On the Isle of Man. <laughs> On the Isle of Man. <laughs> There's more to say about the TT, much more. But first, what is it about this tranquil isle that produces such a wild and improbable race? The people on the island like to do things their own way. Katrina Mackey moved here from Scotland 15 years ago. Well, that's a really... And now teaches university students the history of the Isle of Man. She told us over the centuries the blood and cultures of English, Irish, and Viking clashed and mixed here to create the unique Manx identity. The Manx see themselves as, you know, we're not English, we're not Irish, we are Manx. From what you're telling me, the Isle of Man seems to always be finding its own path. That streak seems to define it. Yeah, it still has that streak of independence. And a lot of it does come from its Norse heritage. The Norse, Vikings, sailed south from Scandinavia more than a thousand years ago in search of places to conquer. In 1079, Norse Gaelic ruler called Godred Crovan invaded the Isle of Man for the third time, third time lucky for him. This was the seat of the Norse yeah. kingdom for a while? For a while, yeah, that's right. Contrary to their reputation, the Vikings didn't just plunder and move on. On the Isle of Man, they established a sort of parliament called the Tinwald that still makes the laws here. It is the longest continuous running parliament in the world, and it is an important part of the Manx identity. <laughs> Another important aspect of identity is the Manx language, which natives have been speaking and singing for nearly 1,500 years. Ruth Kagan Gell works at a cultural organization dedicated to preserving and popularizing the Manx language. Oh my God, that was beautiful. Thank you. Why does it matter to, to save the language? My ancestors spoke Manx, so for me, it's, it's a nice way of feeling like I'm connected. I think if we were to lose Manx, we'd be so much the poorer for it. Let's try and do that all together. Hello. Hi. Manx nearly was lost. By the 1950s, after more and more English speakers visited or settled on the Isle, there were fewer than 200 Manx speakers left when a concerted effort began to revive the language. And I'm going to teach you how to say Jameis. The rebirth of the language has been described as sort of like a phoenix-like story. Yeah, the definitely. True? Yeah, it's a strong, it's a resilient language. And I think there's more and more pride all the time with people embracing Manx and seeing it as a really, really good thing. But it is just like that, the, the phoenix rising out of the ashes. It didn't die. It got perilously close. That's squidgy. OK, we all ready, Velshi Merlu? Today, right, Ruth okay, Kagan Gell teaches adult Manx classes at a local pub. This, and this means knowledge. While just a few hundred yards down the road, four- and five-year-olds are learning to count in a Manx language immersion school. It's really exciting seeing people going from having, you know, one or two words in their very first lesson. You know, you're starting to introduce yourself, Mish Ruth, you know, Koyos, who are you? And you'd say Mish Bill back. Mish Bill. Mish Bill, yeah. Right. <laughs> well done, that's good. 
Manx is spoken when the Tinwald, the Isle of Man's parliament, meets in ceremonial session. For centuries, the Tinwald has charted the Isle's unique path. It was the first legislature in the world to grant women the vote. It especially asserts Manx independence in matters of taxation. England in the mid-17th century had raised its customs duties. The Isle of Man didn't, so you have tobacco and tea and brandy and rum coming from Europe and elsewhere into the Isle of Man that were then taken from the island in small boats and smuggled into England or Scotland. But the smuggling was known as um, running. The running trade, or the trade, yes, the trade. absolutely, yeah. And that was very lucrative. Very, very lucrative, yeah. It was at that point that the British government decided, OK, we really need enough. to do something about this. Enough is enough, yeah. yeah. The British effectively took control of the Isle of Man. And to this day, the British monarch is head of state and has the right to veto any Manx law. In practice, that power is almost never used, and the Isle of Man fiercely guards its independence. You know, we have our own tax laws, um, and the island is very, very proud of that. In a way, what was going on in the 17th and 18th century, the, the trade, mm. was uh, this place was kind of a tax haven back you, then. In, in some respects, I guess you could call it that. And um, it is again today. It is again today, yeah. Um, most companies don't pay any corporation tax at all. Zero. Zero. The level of income tax is much lower than it is elsewhere, so we have a top rate of income tax of 20%. We have a lot of people living on the island who are very, very wealthy, who pay relatively little tax on the island than they would elsewhere. The Isle's total population is a little more than 80,000. But many of the world's biggest banks have a branch here. The owners of more than 1,000 private jets avoid millions of dollars in taxes by registering them on the Isle of Man. Just as it has tried to make its tax laws attractive, the Isle of Man has worked long and hard to attract tourists. By the 1880s, 1890s, a week's holiday by the sea had become a, a British institution, really. And by 1913, just before the First World War, we were seeing 600, 650,000 wow. people visiting the island every summer. Huge, huge, huge numbers of visitors. Among those visitors around the turn of the 20th century were a few wealthy people who brought with them newfangled machines called motor cars. The speeds they were doing were, were quite phenomenal. According to Matthew Richardson, curator at the Manx National Heritage Museum, these were the founding fathers of the race now known as the Isle of Man TT. The TT began actually as a car race. That's where we get the, the name Tourist Trophy from because it began as a race for touring cars. Uh, there was no opportunity to race cars in the United Kingdom at this time because Parliament there had banned road closures for racing. And you guys just said, yeah, sure, we'll close our roads down. Well, partly the Lieutenant Governor was the cousin of the Chairman of the Royal Automobile Club, Sir Julian Ord. The Isle of Man economy at that time was heavily dependent on tourists coming here and he thought that having a racing event would only bring more tourists, and he, he was proved to be absolutely right. Was he ever? When we come back, we'll see how and why the Isle of Man TT has become a bucket list destination for motorcycle riders and racing fans from all over the world. The Isle of Man's unique culture and Manx language set it apart, but it's the race known as the TT that has really put it on the map. First held in 1907, it is the most dangerous motorcycle race on Earth. More than 250 riders have been killed over the years. Yet every year, fans flock across the Irish Sea to watch, and racers clamor for an invitation to ride. Like, it is my life. It, that's the thing. It always has been since I was a wee boy. My dad sat me on the hedge. I watched this bike go past, and I thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Super Sport and Super Twins to the start line, please. Richard Milky Quail was born and raised on the Isle of Man. A Manxman through and through is how he puts it. Ten seconds, I'm not even more than 
1997, he got his wish to race in the TT, and five years later, he won it. So what is it like as a Manxman to win the TT? Well, I mean, there's only ever been three of us that have ever done it in the 118 years or whatever, so I think it's a bit like when you, you go to do your washing on your trousers and you have you stick your washing in, you, you just, I'll just check the pockets before putting you, you reach in there and you'll find 10 pound, and you know, oh yeah, I've got 10 pound richer. <laughs> well, if you can multiply that by a million, that's what it's like to win the TT. It's just like, woohoo! <laughs> the actual prize money is minuscule compared to other professional sports. The winner of this year's top class TT race won just over $30,000. There are five classes in all, dictated by the power of the motorcycle and the number of laps. Riders are constantly braking, shifting, and twisting the throttle thousands of times every lap. Then there is the sidecar race, three wheeled contraptions that scream around the course with a driver and a passenger whose job is to throw their weight around every curve just inches off the ground. You need only to look at old photos to see how the race has changed. Early sidecar outfits looked like what you might see on the street. Today, they resemble angry mutant bobsleds. The first motorcycles were basically bicycles with engines strapped on. Today's bikes are bullets, ridden by some of the top pro racers in the world. I'm trying to beat the clock, not the person in front of me, effectively. Milky Quail gave us a taste of what it's like to ride the course with a bike mounted on a simulator. Up towards the black dub, so got a little oh, This is incredible. And an actual lap playing on a screen in front of him. Over to the left. And then over to the right. Oh, it takes so much physical effort to get the thing to turn through there. So this is Sylvie straight now, Bill. This is one of the fastest points on the circuit. Everything's a blur going by you. 190, 195, 200 miles an hour here. This is nuts, you know that, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's fun, though. It's, it's fun, Bill. He knows a lot of people won't get his definition of fun. Now, the last time you raced as, as a rider, was, what, 20 years 20 ago? 20 years ago now, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It nearly killed you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did, but I mean... What it, happened? I made a one little mistake and... What, what, what was your mistake? I just literally entered the corner too early. So I just caught the rock face with my shoulder, and it just snagged and it pulled me then to the wall on the right, and then I threw it over and hit the wall on the left. And, yeah, that's the that's the flip side of the coin, isn't it? It's just, you know, when it goes bad, it you know, it, it can hurt you. The crash in 2003 ruptured his spleen and punctured both of his lungs among other injuries. I remember I was lying in the hospital bed and a journalist came in to see me and we wanted an interview and stuff and he was trying to put words in my mouth like, "Oh, well, you you must hate it then, mustn't you? Must it's dangerous. You want to must want to get it stopped." And I was like, "You are. Well, why would I want to stop it? It's the best thing in the world that anyone could ever want to do. Why would I want to stop it just because it hurt me? The only way of making this event safe is to not do it. You know, if we're going to race sports bikes through towns and villages on public roads, that inherent danger is going to be there. Okay, guys, ready? Paul Phillips is the man who has been in overall charge of the Isle of Man TT for the last 15 years. <laughs> Some people in our audience who are not really familiar with the race would be surprised at the the casualty statistics 250 casualties over the years six just last year you know that's got some people you know sort of howling that this race is too dangerous it, it shouldn't be i totally understand that um and you know this event really does it embody the sort of uh, human spirit nobody is forced to come and do this and this event does kind of give you means an opportunity to kind of test themselves and push their boundaries and, and live their lives to the absolute limit. Like the ultimate expression of free will. Yeah. Yeah. Even if that free will can get you killed. So it seems, yeah. To be honest, as a rider, you don't really think about it. Well, Hickman takes his third senior TT. 
Peter Hickman has won 13 TT races, including this year's marquee race, the Senior TT. 225 miles over six grueling laps. As a rider, we have already accepted, if someone's here and riding and signed up, we have already accepted what that consequence is if we make a mistake. Yeah, the course is all good all the way to Ramsey. Organizers of the TT have taken steps to minimize risk where they can. Riders are sent off the start line at 10 second intervals to make space between them. But passes, with not an inch to spare, still happen. Perhaps the most significant change has been to strictly limit the number of racers to just over 30 sidecar teams and 100 solo riders. How important is it just to determine that a rider is good enough to be on this course? Very. One of the things when I first started working on the TT was that that wasn't the case. You know, there were people coming here who were ill-prepared. Now, there's a strict protocol for would-be first-time racers, and Milky Quail is a key part of it. The apex is there, see? Okay. He first takes newcomers around the course in a car. So then what's going to happen is... Then, during practice week, he leads them on an actual lap to see how they perform and whether they can keep up. Do you ever have someone you're taking around and you go, they're not ready? Yeah. I remember going behind, when I was behind Milky Quail on my initiation lab, and I actually screamed in my helmet. I'm like, this is crazy. Rennie Skaysbrook made Milky's cut. An Australian now living in California, he is a full-time motorcycle journalist and a part-time racer who was invited here after winning the Pikes Peak race in the U.S. His first TT was last year when six riders were killed. There's some really awful stuff that happens here. You can't sugarcoat it. But on the other side, you know, it is the most incredible place to ride a motorcycle. Like, the danger's up here, the exhilaration is up here. It's so unlike anything else. You ask any motorcyclist and you say, the old man TT, and they all, they all know. During practice week, we met one of the ferries the primary means of getting to the island, and watched as hundreds upon hundreds of racing fans rolled off. To accommodate the 40,000 fans who come to the race, almost every soccer and rugby field becomes a campground. And the roads, while they're open, are clogged with riders. The fan can run them off the boat, sit at the side of the road, watch the hero go past. Half an hour later, after the road's open, they can ride on the same track. It's the best. It is the best, Bill. You know, it's the best. There's no admission fee to watch, and the paddock is open to all. <laughs> Here, fans can touch the stars. One black shirt, one blue shirt. But one visit to the merchandise tent... Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Is all it takes to know that this is a commercial bonanza for the Isle. And make no mistake, that's what it exists for. It exists for economic reasons. It exists to bring people to our island and for no other reason. It doesn't exist because we like motorbikes. We do like motorbikes, but that's not why it exists. One rider was killed in this year's TT, 46-year-old Spaniard Raul Torres Martinez. That there was just one death after the six racers killed in 2022 was a relief to organizers, but also a reminder of the risk that has run through these winding roads for more than a century. A lot of people don't grasp just how wild the event really is. I mean, I'm a part-time racer, I can steer a bike okay, but I'm not the level of these guys. You know, I mean, they do stuff that I just go, I have no idea how you do it. Wow, that's brave. Yeah, that's heart in your mouth. Peter Hickman is one of those guys. This year, while winning four races, he set a new all-time speed record for a single lap. This makes me feel alive. Makes you feel alive? Yeah. You, you can't just leave it like that. You gotta... <laughs> <laughs> Expound, explain, what do you mean? I think you can only really appreciate 
life if you're putting yourself into places that risk it. I'm Bill Whitaker. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. Real-time updates on the Israel-Hamas war on CBS Mornings tomorrow.